Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm with the Lesbian Avengers, here to talk about that movement, an exciting time in lesbian history that um, many people think is still continuing in various other incarnations. So uh, please join me in welcoming Maxine Wolf, who's making a return visit, Marlene Colburn, and Chanel Elaine, who uh, are all activists and occupy various other roles too. Um, let me start by reading a little description of the Avengers. Uh, the Avengers, the Lesbian Avengers is a direct action group using grassroots activism for, to fight for lesbian survival and visibility. The Lesbian Avengers was founded in June, 1992, is that correct? Yeah by six experienced political activists, one of whom is with us. They had a vision for a grassroots lesbian activism that would go beyond visibility to a larger goal of movement building. Let me start by asking my guests if that's an accurate description or if there's anything you would add. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far? All right. Yeah, I mean, we should say that the Lesbian Avengers is a direct action group dedicated to lesbian visibility and survival. Yeah, I, I the quote came to my mind. It's sort of like it, just in my head. I don't think it'll ever go away. The Lesbian Avengers is a direct action group focused on issues vital to lesbian um, visibility and survival. Lesbian visibility. That was, that was it. <laughs> That was but it. I, do think, I do think that from the beginning of it, the one thing that the founders were very clear on was that we didn't want to do frivolous actions. They could be fun, but they couldn't be about frivolous issues. And they weren't about integrating gay male bars or, you know, uh, straight bars. We wanted to take on large, political, significant issues and bring a lesbian perspective to it. Um, so I think that's more important than a lot of the other things in the quote. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any group has to, has different ideas and you have to work them through and figure out what you get, which one you're gonna do, but you have to have a guiding principle. And that was our principle, uh, was not to do, you know, just anything, but to pick out significant issues in, in the lives of lesbians. and in as and and to see lesbians as being part of the larger world. So when I say in the lives of lesbians, I mean all kinds of lesbians doing all kinds of di having different lives, and um, and for us to be uh, picking out issues that would affect them. Well, um, let me start by reading some bios of you before we go to the first action. Uh, Maxine Wolf, you've seen before, and she has, uh, as viewers of the show know, she is a retired emeritus distinguished uh, psychology professor who was very involved, has been an ongoing activist for years, and was very involved in ACT UP, and as we said, is a founder of Lesbian Avengers, and you're doing other actions as well now, is that right, Maxine? You're retired. I am retired from, from academic life. <laughs> I hope I'm never retired from <laughs> political life. Definitely the busiest retired person I know. Yeah, <laughs> I aspire, but I don't know if I'm gonna reach that. <laughs> it's a wonderful condition. Let's go to Marlene, who is a rabble-rouser lesbian activist, member of the original 
Lesbian Avengers founding co-mother of the Dyke March, mother of three young men, partner of 25 years. Welcome, Marlene. Thank you. Hi. Good to be here. Good to have you. Um, Chanel Elaine is a producer and filmmaker um, who is currently in Brooklyn, but travels all around the world and has a very tight schedule. Is that right? <laughs> That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> That's because she's always doing something as well. <laughs> but she's right from her, her main profession. Filmmaking is your main is your main profession. Uh, yeah, uh, I consider myself uh, not only a producer but a social impact producer. So I very much um, engage my activism uh, with um, uh, with my filmmaking in. Uh, short form content, working with nonprofits and philanthropic organizations. Mm -hmm. well, welcome. Let's go to the um, the founding of the group. Um, it was founded in 1992, and Maxime went to the key dinner party where the project was launched. Can you tell us how you happened to go and what was accomplished there? Well, I was getting really frustrated that there was no focus on lesbian activism at the time. And so was Anna Simo. And we both had friend, Sarah Shulman was a friend of both of ours. And we mentioned, we each separately mentioned to her that we were frustrated, there was nothing happening. And she said, why don't you two have lunch? So we did in May of 1992. Anna and I had lunch together and we talked about we were ready to start an organization. And so we decided we would ask a lot of our friends that we had been involved in politics with over the years. And six of us ended up showing up at uh, Anna's house for dinner that night to discuss the issue. And the six of us were myself, Anna, Andadesky, Marie Honan, and Anne McGuire. And is that six? Sarah. Yeah. And Sarah. Oh, and Sarah, right. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Um, and it just, it didn't take very long. We immediately said, yes, we wanted to do something. And then um, we came up with the name and I can never remember how we came up with the name. I just know it was one of those brainstorming moments, which is always great in a group, you know, where you start throwing out things and whatever. And then somebody came up and said, well, what about the lesbian Avengers? And everyone said, sold, you know, that's it. And then Anastimo's son came up with the bomb, uh, the anarchist bomb. Um, and we, and th that night we talked about what kind of actions we would do and, uh, and our guiding principle, which was we would not do uh, minor kind of frivolous actions that we wanted to do actions that were about real world big issues. Um, we didn't want to like integrate straight bars or les you know gay male bars. We wanted to do really political stuff. We were all very political people. And so uh, for instance, just to, to, to throw it in there is that um, uh, Anne McGuire and Marie Honan had been two of the founders of the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization that protested against exclusion in the uh, New York St. Patrick's Day Parade for years. Um, and they had been activists in Ireland before they immigrated. So, um, so anyway, so we, it was, I think it was Anna that came up with doing something on the first day of school about the rainbow curriculum, which was gonna be a new curriculum uh, in the public schools in which for the first time there would be mention of ethnicity and it would, it would try to cover uh, uh, different cultural groups and racial groups and ethnic groups and also included in that was two lines about lesbians and gay men. And, uh, and then there, had, there was starting to be great um, uh, pushback from conservative forces in the city about having the curriculum at all. So we thought that would be a great thing. Of course, we also came up, I just do want to say that we, we, we have always had a sense of humor <laughs> and we came up with several other possibilities, including parachuting into Whitney Houston's wedding um, <laughs> to protest her getting married. Um, we did do our first action about the rainbow. Yes, curriculum. and we're going to show the clip of that. 
Um, one thing I would add, I, in this article I read, um, the writer said that it was part of a, the, you know, playful activity was part of a way to refute the stereotype of the humorless lesbian too. We have fun also. <laughs> but I love your point, but it's not frivolous also. So um, Marlene, how did you happen to get involved in the Avengers? Uh, well, I went to Pride that Sunday and um, apparently the core group of the Lesbian Avengers had printed up 6,000, 7,000 palm cards and they were handing them out. I don't know who gave it. Someone gave me a palm card. It said, come to a meeting at the center, you know, want to be involved in um, lesbian activism. And I, I had just been bitching to a friend that there was nothing political going on that was just literally, that was just for lesbians. And they were like, you know, get off, get off the stick and do something and someone handed me the palm card and I was like perfect I don't have to think of it someone's thought of it already um, and I went to the first meeting and I don't know I think there were 60 or 70 women and crammed into into a room at the center um, and we were off and running and it it was it was a great feeling I I didn't know a single person in that room not one person so um, and over the years I got to know a lot of them and some of them are still good friends of mine so you know, in that in that manner, it was it was great, and it also taught me different ways of doing activism. Um, the Avengers were very much about let's be serious, but let's have fun at the same time. Um, and sometimes in the group, people would say things that I was like, "That sounds really dangerous," and it turned out not to be because of the way that that um, it was thought out and presented and and um, carried to fruition. Well, I read and maybe Maxine can confirm this that when you first came up with the idea of the cards you thought maybe you'd get six or seven people and actually you got 70 60 or 70 is that true Maxine yeah and the, the, the that we designed how to give out the cards with that in mind like we we did not hand them out to people who were already in groups marching in the parade we gave them out to people on the sidelines or people who were marching alone, okay? And uh, because we wanted risk takers because the, the card acted as if the Lesbian Avengers already existed. Okay? And we had a phone number, which was an extension in my house, okay, with a tape machine. And, um, and, and so the, the 60 people who came to that first meeting were incredible and, almost all of them stayed in the Avengers for quite a while and they were risk takers. They were willing to go to Queens where no one goes to do actions or no one went then, okay, and do an action. Um, so it worked. And, and all it said was, you know, um, we want revenge and we want it now. Um, and, you know, sort of if you do, you know, that there were cold blooded liars in the White House. Um, and, you know, we had to do something and come to this meeting. That's all it said. And, and call if you want. And I, I always tell people that the first funny uh, message on the tape machine was from Lydia, uh, this woman, Lydia, who said, um, I hope that this I hope that you are not the sergeant behind the local desk. Because this is my this is my dream group I've been waiting for. Okay. Um, anyway, enough from me. Chanel, how did you happen to get involved? Uh, yeah. So I um, I had recently left the West Coast and uh, was out of the army and uh, had moved to New York. Uh, having not been uh, an activist or political in any way, but wanting to be. Uh, and so I, I believe that I moved to New York two days before Gay Pride in 1993. So um, it would have been the, the first year of the Dyke March, but I didn't know about the Dyke March then. But uh, I believe, were, were meetings on Mondays or Tuesdays? I can't remember. We moved around. Yeah, so I think, I think those meetings were Tuesdays then. Yeah, so I ended up uh, shortly after uh, the Pride Month March um, going to the uh, Gay and Lesbian um, Community Center uh, at the time 
and literally at, when I went there, there was a lesbian Avenger meeting listed. Uh, and so I went and I walked in uh, to an amazing room of dykes uh, in all shapes, sizes, color and form. And, and I sat down uh, and listened to uh, some really smart women have a conversation, very organized and um, very pro and con and such a neophyte when someone said something pro in my head, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I, I believe that. And then when someone said con, I was like, no, no, that's right. I believe that. And, uh, and it just, you know, it was, it was, I was getting a little emotional as, as we were starting to talk because the Avengers and that day um, was, is everything that uh, made up my experience in my early years in New York. Um, and the women that I met there were my only friends and they became my friends uh, and my um, comrades and uh, people that I depended on and continue to depend on, you know, 30 years later, so. Um, what and story? Chanel doesn't tell you that, that in, in her first meeting, we were talking about doing, needing somebody to go up to Maine to help some people who were doing, um, you know, organizing up there with the people up there about an anti-gay uh, amendment. And somebody yelled out, somebody who was running the meeting said, is there anyone here who can join them because we want more than a, a couple of people? And Chanel raised her hand and I will never forget this in my whole life. Somebody said, are you sure you wanna go? And she said, well, I'm a lesbian Avenger of leisure. <laughs> That's okay. right. and, and I have the time to go. And I thought, all right. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. Yep. That's wonderful. I remember that. <laughs> remember that? You were talking about safety, Marlene. Right. A conversation where people were talking about safety and I was like, okay, well, I can go. So. <laughs> well, let's go to the first action if we could. The lesbian, as uh, Maxine previewed, the lesbian Avengers kicked off with a daring action supporting a multicultural curriculum and encouraging elementary school children to ask about lesbian lives. And before we show the clip, let me thank Sue Friedrich for giving us permission to show it. So take a look. Ladies and ladies, gentlemen and gentlemen, we are the Lesbian Avengers! Yeah. Yeah. Here to demand and ensure visibility and survival of lesbians everywhere! That's weird. That is weird. What makes it weird? Teach about lesbians. What's that? Te teach what? Kids? Well, yeah. I mean, don't you think kids get taught about a lot of different things, right? I think, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, you can teach kids. You yeah. teach them about gays, too. Right. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Where you going? All the way down? Yeah, to uh, Middle Village School, I think it's called. That's good. That's good. Yeah. What goes on, huh? What do you think of it? Everybody to each of their own. I ain't gonna go play, boy. Nah, stop that. <laughs> More power to him. 
I'm passing out balloons to school children on the first day of school that say. Move it! Give the balloon back, to let it go. Give me that balloon. today because I have really mixed feelings about this especially as a teacher I'm, a, I'm afraid that we're that we're harassing the kids a little bit but I came because what I've been reading in the papers and seeing about what school tw board 24 is doing is not just not doing in some kind of passive way but taking on an active campaign of hate and intolerance and I just can't stand to see that in another school I'm demonstrating here because I uh, I think children should learn about love not about hate I also think that the people who are against lesbians and gay men in the school curriculum have a larger agenda, which is uh, racist, uh, is to get rid of the multicultural curriculum. And we're, they're attacking us because we're easy to attack. It seems like that action encapsulates a lot of the goals. It's fun, it's outrageous, it's a little bit in your face, um, and all the energy of that coming together seems like it really uh, was a good place to begin. Was any of you, none of you were quite there for that one, right? Yeah, I was. You were? Sure. We looked for you in the clip, but missed you. Um, I'm often not in the clips. <laughs> I'm often too busy to be in the clips. <laughs> Well, while we're talking about video, let me encourage everyone to see on, which is available on YouTube, Eating Fire, being uh, Lesbian Avengers Eat, eat Lesbian Fire. Lesbian Avengers Eat Fire 2. By Janet Baus and Sue Frederick. Right. It really is a hoot. And it goes through uh, a lot of the activities, including, um, you know, your... Uh, erection of a statue of Alice P. Toklas next to Gertrude Stein in the park and the reading and, you know, a lot of the exciting events that you participated in. Um, so, um, do, do, you, are you, do you need info about that first action? Pardon me? Did you the want to have action, The first action is encapsulated in the longer film. Yeah, I'm just saying, did you want more information? Because I didn't sure. see the clip. Oh, sure. Uh, you decided to have a multicultural to protest this um, curriculum. Was that What was the outcome? We weren't protesting the curriculum. We were protesting the fact that they didn't want they it. They didn't want it. Yeah. Right. They were and again, the, that district that in Queens that was led, I believe, at the time by Mary Cummins, the, super, the um, did not want the curriculum there. They were very virulently opposed to it. Right. And we picked out that district because we had a research committee that looked for places that would be good to focus on. And she was totally homophobic and had been also totally right wing about other kinds of issues. And so she basically made our decision for us because right before we were going to do, you know, as we were picking out a place to do action, she kept saying things that were horrifying. Um, but I think the thing about it, you know, that uh, people need to understand is that no one used to do actions in Middle Village, Queens, okay? And, uh, and that we didn't negotiate with police or anything. We just went and we did logistics and we figured out how to do it. 
And on a given day, we just started marching down one of the main streets up to the school, okay? And, um, and sang and chanted and gave out leaflets. And the other thing that we gave out were balloons to the kids that said, ask about lesbian lives, um, which we thought was a good pedagogic move. Um, and, um, uh, and got a lot of coverage and um, we did more than just that one action about it. So uh, we, did, we, we connected with the UFT, the United Federation of Teachers and went to their meeting and asked them to make a statement against uh, the attempt to eliminate that curriculum. Um, we did several meetings uh, several actions with different educational groups, et cetera. So I want people to know that it wasn't like a one shot deal. Right. We also, they also, the, the Avengers also serenaded Mary Cummings outside her house one, one late night. Yeah, on, on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Yes, I saw a clip of it. Well, it's in the film. It's great. Yeah. You were out there, rain or shine, snow or sleet. Um, let me, uh, share a quotation from Sarah Schulman, who said of the Avengers, it grew very quickly. It was also a very radical and open organization. Anyone could be in the Avengers if they were willing to fight for lesbian visibility. So it was the opposite of Turfy. We voted 99% to include trans women and men were part of the group of people who created Camp Trans. And Camp Trans, as we know, is, uh, was written very uh, eloquently about by uh, Michelle T in Against Memoir. Uh, let me ask, let, I, let's turn to legislation, shall we? And the Lesbian Avenger Civil Rights Organizing Project, LACROP, do you call it? Um, they Crop. had an action in Crop. Idaho that is particularly noteworthy and readers and audience members may recall that in Colorado in the early 90s, there was a draconian anti-LGBT uh, proposition that passed. But in Idaho, Proposition 1, it was called, and that was um, being presented and the Avengers were there. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I can speak to that a little sure. bit. Um, you know, that was uh, that was the day that I, it was the project that I volunteered for. It didn't have La Crop as the name quite yet when I volunteered to first go to Maine um, uh, to uh, work on the campaign because as you mentioned, uh, the Christian right was and uh, attacking the rights of LGBTQ people within um, local ordinances, uh, uh, attacking their right for or our right for housing and employment, uh, and we um, we went to be able to help local lesbians um, organize. Uh, against um, very well-funded campaigns by the Christian right. Uh, this was very grassroots uh, organizing. Uh, we basically went there to lend our hands and our time um, to the local lesbians there um, and um, really incredible work happened because we were not willing to be closeted uh, in the way in which the campaign that was uh, actually supposed to be on our side, but wanted us to be, or you know, wanted us, wanted the, the local uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, community to be closeted and fight for this ordinance without actually saying that we were lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or queer. Um, and we refused to do that. And we worked with other lesbians who also refused to do that. And um, you know what we found, which is I think key um, anywhere 
is that once you are not in the closet and you are standing um, out and proud and loud uh, and that people actually get to see you and your humanness, then um, it's a lot harder to hate and to want to take away your civil rights. Um, and as a result of working in Maine, uh, there were a lot of young lesbians who were in the closet who came out um, as a result of the work we did there. Uh, we did a very um, intense door-to-door -door campaign uh, and the area in which we were in, which was uh, Lewiston, Maine and, and Moscow, Maine, although that the ordinance um, failed uh, in, in Maine itself in the areas that we were in, uh, had it just been those areas, it, it would have passed because um, the, the numbers were, were on, our, on our side. And as a result of that experience, uh, we wanted to do it again. Uh, and and um, we did some research to find out where we should go next. And, and Idaho was one of those places. And, and then we, we, ended, we ended up in, in Idaho. Wasn't the Avenger there was an Avenger who was from Idaho, who wrote an article about it in The Nation that um, Maxine forwarded to me. Yeah, Sarah Persley, which was uh, one of the dykes that you know I went with, uh, and who was incredible, uh, and is an incredible organizer, and um, uh, she, um, we went to to her. Um, her home state, yeah. And, you know, I was thinking, we remember, or I remember the Colorado circumstance because the legislation passed, but nobody remembers the Idaho thing because the Avengers, you know, were instrumental in killing the bill. I mean, that's really an accomplishment, an un untold, unheralded accomplishment. There are other factors, I guess, uh, the Mormon church was involved and it's kind of ironic because there was a Lewiston, Maine and there was a Lewiston, Idaho. I know. Uh, there's there's a Lewiston, Idaho. Um, but yeah, in the same way that we organized in a, you know, out and loud door to door uh, campaign um, that was relentless uh, in not only us helping uh, the local lesbians, but in the ways in which they engaged in their communities really made the biggest difference in um, that ordinance um, going forward. Well, I think also that, that, that you did the same thing. You went around uh, organizing as, you know, out uh, gay people in Idaho um, in places that people never did that. And you got people to do uh, community events where they came out publicly. Um, uh, and again, I, I think the most amazing thing in terms of an organizing principle besides being out was the fact that um, you uh, didn't um, evade the fact that this was a, an anti-gay bill whereas a lot of the more mainstream um, LGBT organizations that were trying to organize there just kept focusing on the word like discrimination and never mentioning lesbian and gay. And I think that the fact that the uh, uh, Palouse Avengers that you worked with and the lesbian Avengers working together and using a very out strategy proved that that worked better because the two uh, if I remember correctly, the two uh, areas that you, you won two areas that were very conservative and that nobody ever thought that you would win. Um, and I just should, should mention too, that people were up there for six months, three yeah, months, six, six months. Yeah. For a while. yeah. How did you happen to be able to do that? Did you, um, fundraised or was there a treasury or did you, you know, contribute your own time and your own um, resources? Yes, to all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was, 
there had been fundraising um, and uh, and yeah, people volunteered their time, you know, I, as was mentioned earlier as me saying I was a lesbian of leisure was because I had just gotten out of the army um, and uh, I had the ability to to go and 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 do this work and and you know um, and I, I I also just want to say quickly that this work at the time uh, I was out but I wasn't out to my grandmother and in seeing how this work was influencing local lesbians and them being at a press conference and coming out. I also came out to, um, to my grandmother, you know, everyone on the ground was learning so much um, around and finding, you know, either finding voices as, as I was um, or uh, finding the political and uh, will to be able to represent ourselves in ways that we imagined and, and didn't imagine and the effect that we had um, as we came together as a community uh, is one of the most powerful experiences that, that I've had, so, yeah. Hmm. Well, we can't forget the Jike March, can we? Uh, <laughs> first March was in 1993 in Washington. Yes. Yeah. It was eaten. Do any of you know how to eat fire? I don't do it. I don't, I don't do it. But the, apparently one of your colleagues worked in the circus and instructed some of your peers to do it and became your signature activity or your most symbolic one of your most symbolic activities. And again, it uh, had a serious origin. Can you tell us about that? The Oregon fire bombing. Yes, of um, uh, Hattie, Hattie and her her um, her companion, the man that she was um, Brian assisting, Mock. Brian Mock and Hattie Cohen, Hattie Mae Cohen's, I believe, right, uh, right. who were burned to death, who were burned to death, um, and uh, at the time the Avengers were um, putting together actions and one of the ways we thought we could honor them was to take the fire within, within us and take it and make it our own and eat fire. Um, and the first time we did that, I believe was at an action um, near, uh, in the middle of the village. Uh, and it was, it was an overnight an, action. It was the anti-violence march? Right, it was an anti-violence project um, um, march. And the Avengers participated in that. And at the end of the march, um, the lesbian, we had um, erected a, a, um, a monument to them, a memorial to them, um, and six to eight Avengers um, ate fire. Um, I believe, I don't think that was the first time because the, the, it was also done at the March on Washington, but this, this particular thing was as a memorial to them. Uh, I, I think it was very powerful. Um, a lot of people had, um, it's, it comes from the circus, but in this instance, it was uh, a powerful um, remembrance of the sacrifice that, that those two people had made um, just because they were um, lesbian and gay, disabled on top of that. And it was an assertion of lesbian power and individual uh, power in the face of uh, violence like that. And it also, you're right, it did happen in the Washington March and Avengers ate fire in front of the White House. Is that right? You were there, Marlene, weren't you? Yes, I was a marshal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were the other, were either of you there in the Washington 1993 March? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I was one of the major organizers of, of, of that march. And, um, you know, a lot of effort went into it. We had no idea how many women would show up. So we went down early to, you know, to leaflet and, and talk to women. And everybody we talked to said, oh, yeah, we know about it. We're coming. So it was like, really? How do they know about it? But, you know, that was the kind of network um, that existed at the time with the Lesbian Connection newsletter. And we just did a lot of phone calling and um, a lot of, um, they weren't Zoom meetings, but a lot of um, 
phone call uh, conferences with with groups around the country, and um, people were lesbians were just fired up for that for that. And you know, ten thousand women showed up, and uh, we marched from Dupont Circle uh, to the White House. Uh, but besides the main ones, you also uh, you staged an action at a diner that had evicted or that had thrown out one of your number who was kissing her girlfriend or holding hands? Yes, two members of the Avengers in, in Brooklyn. I think it was in Brooklyn Heights. It was a little diner. Um, and they came to the meeting and said, this had happened. And we were like, we're not standing for that shit. And then, so we went in force uh, to the diner. Um, and I believe there was a kiss in. And I think they amended their ways. <laughs> But you know, it was little things like that. It may have only affected some people, but I'm sure the people in the owners of the diner did not forget that we had been there. <laughs> so there was a whole so. lot of uh, both uh, famous and less famous actions. What was your favorite, would you say? Let me hmm. correct Maxine with this question. It's a good one. <laughs> uh. Well, besides the stuff in Idaho, which I thought was pretty amazing, um, I like the one where we followed the mayor of Denver for an entire day, well, day and night. Um, it, this was when the Colorado uh, amendment was uh, being fought and there were like all these boycotts of Colorado and stuff. And we heard that that the mayor of Denver was coming to New York for all of these, to do meetings about the economic development of Denver. And so um, one of the people that was in the Avengers in Northrop was had media contacts from her old life. And um, she got in touch with them and we found out every single radio station where he was being interviewed um, and, uh, at that time you could call up, you know, they would have all of the, he, he, they would have these interview shows and you could call up and we kept calling. Um, but we also followed him to every interview he was doing with TV people. Um, and so we would be outside chanting wherever he went. And the last place he went was the Plaza Hotel for this big meeting of, of, about the economic development. And we just walked right into the where he was meeting uh, with these people. And we were out in the hallway and they had to drag us, literally pull us out of the, of the, um, of the hotel. But at the end of that day, he gave a, a, an interview and he said that he was not going to continue his economic development um, tour because every time he was interviewed, the only thing people wanted to talk about was the anti-gay proposition. So, you know, and we weren't that many people at each of the stops, we were like four or five people. Mm -hmm. So you don't even need a huge number of people as long as you are persistent is my attitude. We started out, I just wanna say in the morning at the Regency um, Hotel, which is the, the sort of the power breakfast place in New York. <laughs> and we just marched right into the dining room and passed him and, you know, you know, said boycott Colorado and uh, he got the message. That's great. So that, I think that was one of my favorites. I had a friend who was living in Colorado during that time and I said, what happened? And she said, the ballot was so confusing that people thought they were voting for LGBT rights and ended up voting against it. So there are all kinds of insidious tactics that uh, the Avengers are aware of and I'm sure interrupted at every turn. Chanel, what was your favorite action? Uh, I'm gonna say briefly, and I'm, I, I just need to apologize because I am going to need to go because of travel. Um, but I agree that with uh, that what Maxine was saying in terms of uh, you know, just the experiences in, in Maine and in Idaho, um, they were definitely my favorite. But New York, uh, I would say that when we uh, splurged and bought tickets, uh, dinner tickets to a UN uh, Women's Caucus dinner uh, that we were uh, 
planned on taking over the microphone because in their agenda, there was no um, uh, conversations around lesbians uh, within this huge caucus of, of international women. Uh, and I will say, and that, you know, we prayed that we would get to eat first because the dinner was <laughs> amazing. And, you know, we were starving uh, uh, dykes and didn't get to have big dinners like this. And much to our chagrin, they started the programming before the dinner. So we had to rush up and take over the mic, which we did successfully to talk about, not surprising, lesbian visibility and survival uh, on a international level. Um, and uh, we're um, not so promptly, but definitely did not get to have dinner uh, that <laughs> Well, Chanel, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have to leave, but we'll continue with your other two colleagues. But, you know, please come back again when we can talk a little longer. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, Marlene and Max, I love you. And uh, love you too. Love you back. Bye-bye. <laughs> Sounds like it was great fun. So Marlene, what was your favorite action? Yeah. You know what, every action that I participated in or um, helped to put together was a favorite action of mine. Um, I always went into an action thinking uh, something bad could happen and I always came out thinking we did something great. Um, we never knew, uh, we never, there was no action where we ever asked the police for a permit. There was no action where we um, interfaced with the police beforehand. You know, they would call and leave messages on the hotline. You know, can you give us a call? We hear you're doing this. Because we would, we, we pasted and leafletted all over the place. So it wasn't like people didn't know what was gonna, what was gonna go on. Um, and uh, our actions were successful, whether they were large scale or small scale, uh, whether it involved like three or four people or thousands of people. Um, what I, what I most, I'm proud of is that every year at the New York City Dyke March, I still have women come up to me and say, you know, I came out at the, at the 15th Dyke March. And I remember coming up to you and saying, thank you. Um, that was when I was like marching in the front or running up and down as, as a side marshal. Um, Max and I now are rear marshals and we have been for like at least the last 10 years. And, you know, women still come up to us and say, thank you. And uh, that to me, is a lasting legacy that would not exist without the Avengers having, having been in, in uh, existence. Um, so uh, I look back on every action as, as a great action and that um, I enjoyed immensely. Let me quote you to yourself, if I may. <laughs> After my first month in the Avengers, I really thought that 10, in 10 years time, lesbians would rule the world. I remember having some of those thoughts. And here we are 30 years later, and we're still just inching rather than leaping forward. It's a great feeling to know that change can happen. It just takes longer than you think it will. That's very interesting. It's like raising a kid. <laughs> He's like, every day is really, really long. And, um, and you just hope you get to the end. And we, we're just going to keep, keep fighting. Uh, it's Still something that's, that's very important, and uh, we're up for the battle. Now, I have some questions about our current moment that I'd like to consult you about, if I could. Well, can I just say one thing also about oh, the Avengers, which is that um, right now, you know, Marlene and I sort of uh, uh, ran the march, and I wouldn't say ran, facilitated the march. Uh, the Dyke March, which, by the way, is is happening all over the world now. Um, I facilitated it for, for, for 20 years. And, th and then when we got to the 20th anniversary, um, we handed it over to a great bunch of younger women. And I think that that's one of the most significant things you can do as an organizer, which is to, to remind yourself that you're going to die someday and there have got to be people coming after you. And so the truth is that you, a lot of things you never know what the 
impact of it is. But okay. because, you know, Could 10 you or 20 years down the line. Could you oh, read a lot, Max, that you, it was, the sound was breaking up. Yeah. Um, and right, and you need people to come after you. And there's the Dyke March Committee now every year. They're great young women who have taken it over. Um, it's fantastic, so. Right. So it continues. It continues. The saga continues. Yes. Well, my two uh, contemporary questions are, now that everything, uh, when we look back, um, I love the idea that you had a phone bank to contact people in the early days. You had a phone tree. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Uh, but we moved beyond the era of the phone tree. And the other thing that seems to be happening during the pandemic is that targets or, you know, bad operators are no longer housed in buildings. So, you know, you had the Cosmo Action in Women Against AIDS, and in the 70s, there was the Ladies Home Journal occupation, but now a lot, now a lot is social media. And so um, how is it possible to continue in this changed media landscape? How best can you do activism, would you say? Well I would say that being out is still out on the street. Those places are not all online. For instance, right now, Rise and Resist has been doing an incredible number of actions in front of Fox News. Okay. Um, you know, they have buildings. The Senate, you know, the, the Congress is still in Washington in buildings. Now, there's stuff that, went, that you can do online, and people do. They do Twitter campaigns and um, other things like that. Um, social media is definitely prevalent, but I am still a firm believer that direct action works and that you can find out where those people are and you should go there. Um, right. A lot of people now get nervous. They think that, uh, you know, that, that uh, the government is going to come after them. And my, my philosophy has always been the Secret Service doesn't want to kill you. <laughs> they just want to protect the president. Mm -hmm. and, and in ACT UP, we went to, you know, we actually uh, infiltrated a talk that George Bush was giving. Um, you know, we've done many things like that. When, when after the bomb went off at the World Trade Center, uh, people said you couldn't do any direct action in New York because the cops would get you. And we blocked every bridge and tunnel. Okay. So it, a lot of it is what your head is about. It's not about where the, the stuff is. You have to figure out all the ways that you can uh, uh, move many different tactics um, to get the job done. To, you know, we've had a strategy and then we use a lot of different tactics. You have to have a goal, that's the important thing. Then you figure out how to how to do it, how to get there. I would I would never I would never use social media to plan an action. I believe in bodies in the streets. Oh, um, you're of the same. And, you know, bodies in the streets uh, hand, wins hands down every time. Uh, the media does not cover a Twitter action. They don't cover it well. Who said what on Facebook? Unless it blows up in someone's face uh, because the right thing didn't happen but they do cover bodies in the streets. That's what they write about. That's what people see. And personally, I don't care if the media writes about it. What I care about is that lesbians know about it. They know that the, the, the last Saturday in June or the Saturday um, before, the, before um, the Pride Parade that the Lesbian Avengers and the Dyke March Committee are gonna host the New York City Dyke March and they come out. I don't even I don't even think there's any advertising about it. People just know that that's what's going to happen, and they come. Um, believe it or not, we're getting to the end of the interview, so I'd <laughs> like to ask each of you for last words, a concluding message to our audience. 
starting with uh, whoever wants to go first. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's very important to be out. Uh, it's a hard thing. It's probably one of the hardest things you'll do, but we have the opportunity to come out every single day. Like I work in a major hospital. Um, people walk in and out of my office all day when they, they look to, 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 my, uh, to my left, they see photos of my family on the wall, on the wall. There is no doubt that I'm a lesbian. I don't have to say that I'm a lesbian. They know that I'm a lesbian. Um, but sometimes you do have to say to people you're a lesbian, but if you're, you know, if you're afraid to come out, uh, you just have to take that step. You have to believe that um, people around you will have your back um, and that you have the fortitude to uh, persevere against any sort of um, prejudice you may, you may encounter. Because we all encounter prejudice. We encounter it because we're women. We encounter it because of the color of our skin or our ethnic heritage or uh, whatever we happen to believe. But, and you know, that's, that's messed up. But on the other hand, it uh, makes, you, m makes you realize, hey, I'm still here. I can still go forward. And um, that's what it's all about. I couldn't agree more. And I remember my friend and whom some of you know, Carla J, came to New Orleans where I was living in the early 90s and somebody in the audience said, oh, do you think we could come out or, you know, and Carla said, yes, come out. I mean, there, you know, I know there are extenuating circumstances for a lot of people, but I agree, Marlene, I can't think of anything more empowering personally than coming out, even if you have to do it again and again in all different contexts. So that's a really good point. And also in our actions, you know, um, we're not, you know, we, I feel, and I learned this, I was, the Avengers seem to believe this too. You gotta be an open lesbian in whatever you do, you know? You're not a concerned citizen. You're a concerned lesbian citizen, <laughs> but uh, we digress. Maxine, what are your last words? Uh I just, you know, want to basically say that uh, it's really important that, first of all, that we understand that lesbians have been in the forefront of social and political movements, progressive social and political movements historically. This is nothing new, and it's nothing new that people try to make us invisible. So it's important that we make ourselves visible because no one is gonna do that for us. And the same thing is true about taking care of business. You know, we have issues and they are different from other people's issues. They're not better, they're not more important, they're just different. And that we have to be the people who get out there and say what they are and do something about it because no one's gonna do it for us. So I think that that's very important. And I know that there are many younger people uh, are out and they, uh, they, they don't understand uh, the privilege they have in life to be out um, and how many people are still not out. And I always say to people, you know, you think you are still the periphery of the periphery. And there are kids in Brooklyn that are committing suicide. So it's not even where you live. It, it needs people to be out there as role models to show that you can live a really good life, that you, it's not a lifestyle, it's a life. And I think that's very important to remember and that your life is important. And it's gonna be really important to the people who come after you to know that you existed. Maxine Wolf I agree with that. and Marlene Colburn. Thank you very much. Lesbian Avengers. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>